Anybody got a Bible? If you didn't bring a Bible with you this evening, hold your hand up real high. And uh, these ushers will get one to you. And let's all go to 1 Peter, the second chapter. 1 Peter chapter 2. Then also we'll go to Luke chapter 14. 1 Peter 2. Luke 14. Now, uh, the Sarasota crew has joined with us live tonight. And uh, sometimes, you know, what last week uh, you guys were joined with us there in Sarasota live. Put them up on the screen while I'm talking about this. How about it? And um, I, uh, I've, I've, it keeps coming up to me that some other folks are going to want to join us live on Friday nights. Friday Night Live. And uh, so, uh, pastors, uh, church leaders, if you want to join us Friday night, our uh, tech guys have been researching and looking to how to provide you the best feed and uh, the similar situation, you know, to what's between us and uh, Sarasota. Uh, depending on your equipment, uh, there there will be different levels of it. Or maybe there's groups that want to join us. Uh, and uh, so let us know. And our uh, guys that have the technical expertise will assist you and help and make recommendations. And uh, I believe more folks are going to want to join us. And you know, it, it, it is important. It does make a difference when it's live. Because the Spirit of God is moving here. How many, he, how many believe He can move in 50 places all over the world or 100,000 places or a million places at the same time? And, and now our, and our generation has the technology to see and hear each other at the same time. And so uh, I believe we should take advantage of this. And so uh, pastors... Um, and, and folks that want to join with us, let us know. Now, we're not going to ask you for any money, and your offering would stay there with you in your church, and we're not going to pull right. There's not going to be a charge, nothing, no anything. Just if you want to be a part, we'll be a part. And we can, you know, the Lord might want us all to stand up and pray for something or believe for something, and, and there can be a, 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 a joining God joining. And I don't know all about it, but anyway, if the Lord puts it on your heart, contact us and let's pursue. It'd be neat to look up on the screen and see a bunch of different congregations uh, join up at the same time. And we could all shout together and, and we could be at different places. And The Lord gave us this technology for a reason. I know it's being used for some things that are not good, but the devil always has tried to pervert what God has given and done. But we can use it for the right thing, can't we? And a lot of other people are too, but we can do it as well. First Peter 2, did you find it? Luke 14 as well. First Peter 2 and 5. Let's read the Amplified. First Peter 2 and 5 says, Come. And like living stones, be yourselves built into a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable and pleasing to God through Jesus Christ. Pleasing to God. We have been made priests unto our God. Priests offer sacrifices, don't they? Is this New Testament? Are we to be offering sacrifices today that are pleasing to the Lord? Not sacrifices for sin. There's been the one and final sacrifice made for sin, that is the Master. His blood forever has paid the price. And there's nothing we can do to add to it and should not try. And yet, there are other sacrifices we can offer. In Hebrews, the 13th chapter, 
And the 15th verse, you don't have to turn there, they'll put it up for us. Hebrews 13, 15 says, by him let's offer up the sacrifice of praise to God. Continually, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. That's something we can give. That's a sacrifice. Verse 16 but to do good and communicate, forget not. This is, these are other sacrifices. There's thanksgiving and praise and worship. Here's giving. Communicate means sharing. And he's talking about sharing material things. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. We can and should offer sacrifices. And we can offer sacrifices that God will receive and with which he will be well pleased. Look with me in Luke now, please. Luke 14. Luke 14 and 26. I'll be reading from the CEV, the complete English version. Luke 14, 26, the CEV. Jesus said, You cannot be my disciple." Unless you love me more than you love your father and mother, your wife and children, your brothers and sisters. You know, the Bible refers to God as a jealous God. And he insists on having the number one spot. Right? Not shared spot. I've had people want to fight with me over this and say, well, my family comes first and get in my face and shake a finger. Well, if they do, God is not. There's only one number one spot. (laughs) And if he's first, mama's not. Your spouse is not. Your kids are not. Your grandkids are not. And if you put your kids first, you know what you're teaching them? To put their self first and their kids first, not God. Are you listening, saints? And it's not good. If you put them first, you're teaching them. They come first, not God, not church, not the Word, not the things. They come first. And that's why a lot of kids have such a terrible time when they begin to go to school and in college. They're self-centered. Everything revolved around them at home. And they think that's going to continue at school. And they're shocked. (laughs) When they begin to discover that other people have lives too. And that not everybody thinks the world revolves around them. And sometimes when it doesn't, they can't stay and they, they won't hold a job. And you, I don't have to explain it to you. There's a lot of problems out there now. Because of people who don't know how to be happy working in the back. <laughs> huh? <laughs> That's another message. Verse 27, Jesus said, you cannot be my disciple unless you carry your own cross and come with me. Can you see in this some sacrificing? (laughs) 28, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. What is the first thing you'll do? Won't you sit down and figure out how much it will cost? How much it will cost? How much it will cost? What's going to happen? It's going to cost. It's going to cost you something. We're going to build a building out here. It's going to cost something. Millions of dollars. Right? But we're happy about it. Right? Because we're going to get more than what it costs. You believe that or not? You count the cost. So... We see that in order to follow the Lord, in order to be a a committed Christian, it's going to cost you something. In fact, it's going to cost you a lot. In fact, it's going to cost you everything, according to Jesus. But that mentality has, has escaped a lot of folks. We've got two groups of Christians nowadays. They've been with us a long time. 
we've got uh, always suffering Christians. To them, Christianity is suffering all the time. Always suffering. But now, with word and faith and charismatic folks, we've got another group. No suffering. <laughs> At all. <laughs> no suffering saints. And, and they are ready to come and you tell them how we can get money and how we can prosper and how we can be healed and how we can be led and how we can be free. But if it's going to cost us anything, no, we redeem from that. <laughs> we redeem from any suffering, all sacrifice, all cost. That is not true. Neither one of those groups are right. We have been redeemed from suffering the curse of the law. We have been redeemed from suffering the penalties for sin, the wages of which is death. But there's another suffering. A suffering according to the will of God. I'm quoting scripture. Hmm? <laughs> oh boy. That's exciting, isn't it? <laughs> How about I read some scripture to you? And yet the scripture talks about uh, two causes or two reasons for suffering. And we need to differentiate 1 Peter 3.17, you don't have to turn to these, although they're going to, I guess three of these are going to be in Peter, so it's up to you, 1 Peter. 1 Peter 3.17, he says, it's better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. Did you notice that if? It could be the will of God that you suffer certain things, but not that you suffer for evil-doing. But that you suffer for well doing. First Peter two twenty. First Peter two twenty and amplified says, After all, what kind of glory is there in it if when you do wrong and are punished for it, you take it patiently? What good is that? But if you bear patiently with suffering, when you do right and what is undeserved, it's acceptable and pleasing to God. Now that sounds like those sacrifices. That are well pleasing to God. There are two causes for suffering. There is a suffering because of our mistakes. Did you hear me friend? Because of us missing it. Because of us coming short. But there is a suffering according to the will of God. But it's not suffering from the curse of the law. Primarily it's suffering persecution. Anybody excited about this? Well, I know you're not quite there yet, but just, just hang on. It get, this gets exciting. Amen. This gets extremely exciting. The truth will make you free. Amen. There is a suffering according to the will of God. 1 Peter 4.19 refers to it again. Now, if you, want, if you want to get some more on this, take your time, sit down sometime and read 1 Peter and 2 Peter through carefully and slowly. And look for everywhere it says suffer and everywhere it says glory. Because the two are connected. 1 Peter 4.19 says, let, him, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to Him in well-doing as unto a faithful Creator. There is a suffering according to the will of God. Philippians 1.29 Philippians 1.29 says, For unto you it's given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on Him, but also to what? Suffer. Suffer for His sake. Now, some people have emphasized these scriptures to the exclusion of others. And they believe everything they're suffering is for Christ's sake or for the glory of God. Being sick, 
being broke, being depressed, being a failure. But you'll find these things are mentioned specifically in the curse of the law that Galatians 3.13 says we've been redeemed from. And, you know, Paul, when he was still Saul, met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And then uh, the man of God went and ministered to him. Uh, he, He showed them, he said, what things he must suffer for his name's sake. And Paul gives a list in 2 Corinthians of a lot of the things he suffered. I mean, he talks about being beat with sticks. He talks about being stoned. He talks about being shipwrecked. He talks about all kind of things. Something that is conspicuous for his absence, he doesn't talk about being diseased. Hmm? But did he suffer? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. He suffered. He suffered a lot of stuff. But it was for the kingdom of God. And this is how you can tell what is, according to the will of God, suffering versus vain suffering and suffering for our own mistakes. We should not just lump everything together and go, well, if we're suffering, it must be the will of God. Oh, no. No, you and I both have suffered a lot of stuff simply because we missed it. Did you hear me, friends? It wasn't the will of God. It wasn't the plan of God. And we will get no reward for suffering it. Did you hear me? (laughs) No. But there is a suffering according to the will of God, doing something he told you to do, and it costs you to do it. Now, that suffering results in glory. In fact, the scripture says, if we suffer with him like that, we shall also reign with him. (laughs) There's a qualification. Can you say glory to God? But do you understand one reason we're talking about this is that the idea of suffering or or sacrificing or or, or, or paying a price is kind of foreign to some folks in our circles today. I mean, if it gets to costing, they feel led to change churches (laughs) or or move or or relocate or something. (laughs) Here's how you can tell. If it is a suffering according to the will of God. Well, let me back up. All you got to do is ask yourself this question. Who's benefiting from my suffering? Are you all with me, friends? If nobody's benefiting from your pain and suffering, it is not a suffering according to the will of God. It is a suffering because of our own faults and mistakes, or even ignorance. Sometimes it wasn't that you did something maliciously, you just did something dumb. But the Lord's merciful. Isn't He? Paul said this, he said, I suffer all things lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. He said, we we looked at it in, in, in recent times I, he said, I, I, I'm experiencing this, I, I, I'm dealing with this, I, I'm, for your sakes, for your sakes. We saw it a half a dozen times, for your sakes. Why was, why was he going through all that? That stoning and that being shipwrecked and, and beat with rods and, and, and all that stuff, and heat and cold and, and, and hunger sometimes. Why was he going through all that? To get the word to them. To get the gospel to them. And when it comes to these things, we ought to be willing, friends, to pay it all. Down to our life. Down to our last breath. And if that's not there, then we're not where we need to be. And when you see the truth of it, you'll want to be there. Anybody with me tonight? You believing with me? Please do. Go with me to 2 Corinthians. Now, 
Now, if you haven't been with us in pre, I, I just reviewed a little bit just then. But uh, if this is new to you, don't just take my word for it. Go in the back and, and get, get the messages or go online, download them. Go, check all the scriptures. Go with us through them one by one and see if that's what the word says. See if that's true. Check it out. In uh, first, Second Corinthians, the 12th chapter and the 15th verse. 12.15, this is also an indicator of godly sacrifice versus something else. He said, I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend... And be spent for you, even though I get less and less from you. (laughs) Now, notice these two words. Very gladly. If it's not very gladly, it's not very godly. And if you're sacrificing with lamenting. And mournfulness and crying and feeling sorry for yourself. Then uh, it's not the kind that you get rewarded for. Because the kind that you get rewarded for is the very gladly. It's costing you. It's costing you dearly. But nobody's making you do it. And you're not sad about doing it. You're happy. You're not just glad. You're very glad. It's costing you everything. And you're very glad about it. This has to be faith. This this has to be spiritual. Doesn't it? What kind of giver does God love? God loves, the Bible said. He loves a cheerful. Somebody say cheerful. Cheerful, glad to do it, prompt to do it. Somebody say, glad to do it, it. happy to do it. (laughs) This is an identifier of whether you're doing something uh, in the Spirit, faith, something that pleases God, or whether uh, you're off on some pride trip. Are just confused or deceived. Anybody remember 1 Corinthians 13? Turn there, please. Did y'all say you're believing with me? There's somewhere I'm wanting us to get tonight. I'm going to need some help to get it. Hmm? And I said, well, look to the Lord. Yeah, I am. But you have a part to play too. You have to have ears to hear it. Or else he won't let me give it. Y'all with me? That's just the truth. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13. Notice in verse uh, uh, 3. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor... And though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it's the word for love, it profits me nothing. It's good for nothing. It's vain. How could that be? That you give everything you had. You even gave your body to be burned and it was absolutely good for nothing. How could that be? Because you're giving it, obviously, for the wrong reasons. And it comes back to a self-centered thing. I'm amazing. (laughs) I'm going to sacrifice everything. It's hard. But I'm going to do it. And in their mind, even if they don't say it, they're saying... 
I am some Christian. I am super spirit. <laughs> and if that's what's driving you, and if you're given because of who's going to find out about it, and what they might say, and what they might think, and love is not your motivation, they might get some good out of it, but you get nothing. You'll get no reward, no benefit at all. Profits, nothing. How can you tell that you're not doing that? We just, we just saw it. If, if somebody is benefiting and the burden's coming off of them and their need is getting met and you care about them, even if it's cleaning you out, it's making you happy. Hmm? You're not putting on some spiritual front for somebody. If nobody knew it, you don't care. Because the main thing you want it is happening. They're getting relieved. Their needs are being met. They're being helped and taken care of. And that makes you happy. 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 And you will spend and spend and spend and be spent and you will do it very, very gladly. Why? Here's the great truth, friends. It's because you value them so much more than you do the stuff. And you actually are treating them better than yourself. You're preferring them. You'd rather they had it than you did. Because you love them. And this is not just supposed to stop with your kids. We're supposed to love our brother and our sister this way. Right? And be willing to sacrifice. Just like the Master did for us. He endured the cross. The Bible said, why? For the joy that was set before Why? He could see you. He could see me. He could see us not going to hell. He could see us having a place with Him and with the Father. He could see our sins paid for and taken care of. So He could deal with anything. He could, he could suffer it all and have the strength to do it. Because there's nothing more powerful than love. Love makes you strong. Love makes you so strong, the devil can't do anything with you. (laughs) There's nothing stronger in the universe. Because God is love. Can you say amen? Whoo-wee. Go with me, please. Are you holding a place? Where? First Corinthians 13? Yeah, you already read that. Uh, go with me to um, Matthew, the 13th chapter. Thank you, Lord. Matthew 13. Sacrifice, in many people's mind, is associated with sadness. And that's wrong. Godly, the godly kind of sacrifice that he's talking about is associated with joy. Did y'all hear me, friends? Well, we're going to have to sacrifice. <laughs> Sorrow. Sadness. Loss. It's so hard. Well, why is it so hard? Why would it be so hard? 
Look at this in Matthew 13. Matthew 13, 44, Jesus said, Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to treasure hid in a field, which, uh, the which when a man has found it, he hides it. And for what? For what? For what? He's so excited. Why? He's about to spend every dollar he's got. And he's happier than he's ever been. Anybody with me? For joy thereof, he goes and sells all he has. Do you see the man crying? But I gotta sell everything. This is costing me every penny I've got. The price is too high. It's too high. It's, that's too much. Nobody should ask you to pay that much. It's too much. It's everything I've got. <laughs> no, that's not what's happening. What's happening? He's more excited than he's been. And it's costing him every dime he's got. And he's excited. (laughs) Y'all ever see those car auctions on TV? I saw guys all over the place go, yeah. (laughs) There's two or three of them that's real famous. And and now they got these HD cameras. And you can watch these cars. I was was watching that a while back. There was this 60's vintage car that they brought through. Bidding took place on it. And finally, it sold for over a million dollars. And it was virtually, I don't think it was drivable on the street. It's a 45-year-old car that you probably can't even drive on the street. And they showed the camera to the guy that got it, and he's about jumping up and down. He is just ecstatic that he just paid a million dollars for this 45-year-old car you can't drive on the street. <laughs> now, there's a lot of folks that would look at that and they would say, that's crazy. That's crazy. Ain't no way that pile of uh, bolts is worth a million dollars. To him it was. <laughs> to him it was. Not only did he pay a million dollars, he did it. Glad. He was happy to give them his money. Because <laughs> he gets to take this 45-year-old car that you can't drive on the street. Home. <laughs> What's the value of something? The value... Is established by what somebody's willing to pay for it. Right? Right? Jesus has proved our value to him. Hasn't he? There might have been some angels shaking their head when he bought us. (laughs) Thinking... You got to be kidding me. <laughs> How much is he paying for them? <laughs> Every drop of the Son of God's blood, which contained, he had no earthly father, the life is in the blood. Yes. The life of the Son of God, he paid every drop to buy them? So next time the devil tries to tell you you're not worth anything, (laughs) you say, well, please tell me why that the master paid the biggest price that's ever been paid for anything in the universe for us. It sets our value eternally. Now, a lot of people don't believe it. They haven't accepted it. They don't act like it. But it's true. He has proven our value to him 
by what he was willing to pay to get us. And it's a done deal for anybody that will receive it. The question remains, what's his value to us? Are y'all with me, friends? How much are we willing to pay for him, for his things? Now, we don't have to pay for salvation. That's bought and paid for. But where your, your treasure is, that's where your heart is, too. And what do we value? Jesus is saying the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is like this. It's like this man who found this treasure. And because he was so ecstatic and so overjoyed about it, he, he went immediately and sold everything he had to come back and buy it. And he was very glad to do it, wasn't he? The next verse says again, the kingdom of heaven is like the merchant man. Seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, he went and sold all that he had. Say it out loud. All he had. He He keeps saying all he had. Now our text in Luke 14 talked about that. He said, unless you're willing to forsake all you have and follow me, you can't be my disciple. What does that mean? I have to be valuable enough to you. That you will pay whatever it costs. Amen. That's right. Everything. Yeah. To follow me. That's right. And be with me. Yeah. And, and obey me. And find and do my plan. That has not been the case. With millions. It is actually. The, uh, the revealer. Of the true and the false. Jesus talked about the hireling, didn't he? He said, when the wolf comes, what does the hireling do? He's out of there. Why? Because he's only there for the paycheck. Right? And he is not endangering his life with a wild animal over somebody else's sheep. What does he value? He values himself. And whatever pay he can get for himself. And if he's not getting paid, and if it could cost him something, he's out of there. Right? He's gone. And Paul challenged false apostles. I want you to to, to read about it. You got time for this or not? One of the reasons why he did some of the things that he did was, he said so, to uh, challenge the false guys. In 2 Corinthians, turn there, the 11th chapter, 2 Corinthians 11. I'm going to summarize a little bit. You can read these. Maybe you're already very familiar with it. But Paul had said on more than one occasion, he said, Me and Barnabas and others, he said, don't we have a right to be supported? Don't we have a right not to have to work secular jobs, but for you to support us? He said it. He said the labor is worthy of his hire. Don't muzzle the ox that treads out the the grain. He quoted different scriptures to him. He said, but because of what's going on, I'm, I'm not going to take anything from you. And he'd go to places, and apparently for periods of time, he would be there with them, no salary, no pay. And he did jobs on the side. And yet he told them, he said, you ought to support us. So why is he doing it? There are more than one reason, but here's one. In 2 Corinthians eleven eight, he said, I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. So there were churches he was receiving funds from. But the church of Corinth at this time, he, he did not. Previously, he did not. He said, when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man. For that which was lacking to me, the brethren that came from Macedonia supplied. And in all things, I have kept myself from being burdensome to you. And so will I keep myself. As the truth of Christ is in me, no man's going to stop me of this boasting. 
Why? Because I love you not? God knows. But what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. He was talking about false apostles. And he was saying, okay, they're an apostle like me, let them do what I do. Let them work three years with no pay. Let them show it. Prove it. Why? Because he knew. The reason they're there is to get the money. And if it's going to cost them something, they're gone. Come on, y'all listening to me, sir. And this is true. I don't care whether it's a, a preacher or whether it's a lay person. The same is true with everybody. You find out when it starts to cost you something, you find out if you're a hireling or not. You find out what you love by what you're willing to pay. Are y'all with me, friends? Go to Genesis, please. Jesus said uh, you, you should count the cost. He said, you, you, you must not love anybody more than me. And you've got to be willing to sacrifice all and follow me. How many believe this is still true? This is not changed. <laughs> this is true. But it's not a sad thing. It's not a depressing thing. The question is, what are we getting? Hmm? Three nods and a grunt. Yeah, it's going to cost us something to do this right. But the question, how can we do it very gladly? Because of what we're getting. What we're getting. Not, not only in this life, but in the next, especially. Moses had the foresight and revelation and faith. The Bible said he chose... And identified with the people of God who were a slave nation and mistreated. When he could have been in the palaces with everything doing everything, he chose that instead of that. Why? Because the Bible said he had respect toward the recompense of reward. (laughs) He had the faith and insight to see where this thing is going. And hoots which side you want to be on (laughs) when everything's said and done. And that that is fleeting and passing away. And this is the eternal kingdom of God that lasts forever and ever. In uh, Genesis, the 29th chapter. Everybody say, very gladly. Very gladly. gladly. Is it going to cost you? Uh Uh-huh. And how should you feel about that? Like the guy that paid the million dollars for the car he couldn't drive on the street. Huh? Why? Because you see value where others don't. Hmm? Why would you do it? Phyllis and I have left everything multiple times now, following the plan of God. Started over from scratch almost, it seemed. And I don't feel deprived. She doesn't. We're actually right now, we're in the best shape we've ever been. And every time we've done that, you might not have some stuff for a while, but then you wind up with more than you ever had before. And the reason you don't hear us telling sob stories about what we gave up is because we don't feel that way. (laughs) It was a privilege to have the opportunity to make a sacrifice. Right? And if we gave up something, it's not even worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed. Isn't that that our scripture? Huh? What's that scripture? Anybody know it? Romans? 8.18? What does it say? I reckon that the sufferings of this present time 
are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed. I've had people uh, leave the ministry. They were helping us and they left. And now they don't. I've had people look at me with angst in their voice and go on and tell me, it's so hard, you know, being in the ministry. It's so hard serving the Lord. And I'll be honest with you, I could not relate to what they're saying. I thought, what are you talking about? (laughs) I didn't say that, but I thought it. What are you talking about? What's so hard? I don't get to get drunk every night. I, I don't get to lie and steal. I don't get to have affairs or, or whatever. You know, what are we talking about? What is so hard not doing so we can do this? And I actually, I drove away from one situation and I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, I don't understand that. Why do they think it's so hard to serve God and be in the ministry? I count it the greatest, it's the privilege of my life. I mean, I say this all the time. I say, Lord, it is the privilege of my life to do what I do. I am so thankful. I don't, I don't think it's hard. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's some things that you have to do and there's some price and cost but it's not worthy to be compared with the glory. And the Lord began to show me this. This is the phrase that he gave me, and I began to see it, that they love something else more, something they should not love. They love it more than they do him. And that's why it's pulling on them all the time. Uh, Let's hold Genesis for a, 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 another moment. Go with me to the book of John. Hold on to Genesis. I think we're coming back there. John 12, actually, uh, uh, well, that's fine. That's, let's do that, and then we'll, I think, we'll, uh, maybe I'll just read the rest of it to you. Uh, John 12 and uh, 2. They made him a supper, Jesus And Martha served. And Lazarus, who was cold and dead in the tomb not long ago, is sitting at the table saying, pass the biscuits, please. (laughs) They are having a hallelujah time. You're talking about life from the dead? Literally. Literally. I mean, just not long ago, Mary and Martha were out there crying their eyes out grieving. He's been dead for days. This is amazing. Now they're sitting at the table. Their brother's smiling and laughing right across the table from them. This is a miracle. And verse 3, Mary, who is so thankful that her brother's sitting at the table, she goes into her bedroom and gets the most expensive thing she, she owns. In those days, spices and ointments were like gold and precious metals. And she had this box, not just a dab, but a box of spikenard. What does it say? Very costly. When the Bible says very expensive, you, you should believe it. Right? 
it, it depends. There's different ways to try to figure its cost because the Bible gives you some numbers and figures. But it must be somewhere around $20,000, $30,000. And it's the most expensive thing she had. And she came and anointed the feet of Jesus. She broke it. And when she did, I guess it all ran out on his feet. Thirty grand. And the house, and she, she took her hair and wiped his feet off, the excess. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. And, and this is so picturesque because the Bible in Philippians 4 tells us that God smells the sweet smell of monetary offerings and things given to him. And so there was, there was a physical ointment, a physical aroma, I should say, filling this room. And there was a spiritual aroma Amen. that was filling this room. Yeah. A sacrifice. Yes, well pleasing Glory. to God. And you know what Jesus' own staff said about it? What a waste! Is their response to this beautiful act that this thankful sister <laughs> did with Jesus? Verse 4. Judas was the main spokesman. Judas Iscariot, which should, that you could read that, is about to betray him. Verse 5. He said, why wasn't this ointment sold for 300 pence? That's about 300 days of average worker wage, which is how we get to that number. Twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. It depends on what you're getting paid. Why wasn't this sold for $30,000 and given to the poor? Well, that sounds religious. He's indignant. Righteously, supposedly. Indignant. <gasps> what a waste. Matthew just records it as saying that the other disciples joined in with him and said, to what purpose was this waste? Wow. Wasted on who? Come on. <laughs> Jesus' closest staff are saying this was wasted just dumped on Jesus' feet. That's a waste. That's a waste. It's a waste. Wasted on Jesus. Wasted. This could have been given to the poor. Hear the subtlety of the devil. The devil quotes scriptures. The devil talks about doing good works. The devil talks about helping the poor. And it's a wrong, bad spirit behind it. Because what's really going on, the next verse tells us. Judas said that not because he cared for the poor. He didn't care about the poor. And yet he's talking about this should have been given to the poor. Next time somebody starts talking about, they, they should do that for the poor. Just stop them and say, what are you doing? Because if you're not doing anything and you're saying what they should be doing, you are a hypocrite. A judging hypocrite. Well, if I had all that money, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Jesus said, if you're faithful in little, you'd be faithful in much. If you're unfaithful in little, it's accepted according to what a man has. Not according to what a man has not. So don't try to talk that and say that. No. You're not held accountable for what you don't have. But if you're not doing anything with what you have. Don't say one word about anybody else doing anything with what they have. Unless you want to be like this guy. He didn't care about the poor. He's a thief. And he had to bag. And he bare what was put therein. Why is he so upset? Because the poor, the poor. 
The poor need, need this money. People are going hungry. Lying. Thieving. Disciple. Verse 7. Jesus said what? Leave her alone. wonder what he's saying to folks today. <laughs> Leave them alone. Shush. Hush. Leave them alone. Go to Matthew. Notice this. Matthew 26. 26, 13. This is very important. Are everybody awake? You? What are we talking about? Was Mary, did Mary sacrifice something? She, did. she could have bought a new chariot with this. <laughs> she could have bought a closet full of new clothes. Couldn't she? She could have bought some new jewelry. She could have went on a vacation to Athens. Huh? Spa treatments, right? Stay in the best hotels. <laughs> she could have ate out the best restaurants for the next five years. Huh? Did this cost her anything? Only the nicest thing she had. Only the best she had. The biggest she had. Why don't she do this? Is she thinking as she's breaking it? I love my ointment. Uh, Why am I doing this? My ointment. Oh no. My ointment. Oh no. Thirty grand gone. Oh no. 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 I think she wished she'd had two boxes. Hmm? I don't think she'd have cared if it had been a million dollar box. Right? Why? Her brother is sitting up here alive, laughing at the supper table. Jesus did that for them. She's not trying to pay him. She just loves him. He's everything to her. She wants to say it some way. She's told him thank you 200 times the last couple of days, but it just some way is not enough. She wants to show him. So she's looking around the house and she remembers, I got that alabaster box. And that's the best smelling stuff I have ever smelled. And I think she planned it. And at the right time, after everybody had eaten and sitting around talking and things had calmed down a little bit and she's not interfering or bothering anybody, she walks through the door with this box. She said, Master, I have something I'd like to give you. He said, What, Mary? Would you allow me? He said, Sure, dear. Would Jesus wear a Rolex? Absolutely. <laughs> he wore a $30,000 box of perfume on his feet. Can you see how twisted? Yeah, there's some greedy preachers around. There's some greedy folks that sit in the pews too. I mean, there's... They're, there's some folks around that are messed up and that will lie and steal and, and twist the scriptures, but that doesn't change the truth. That's right. That's right. This is precious. This is holy, isn't it? And this is substantial, significant sacrifice. Why? Because of love. Because something, someone is more valuable to you by far than this. And Jesus told them, Judas and the other guys, be quiet. Leave her alone. She has done a beautiful thing for me and to me. And verse 13 of Matthew says, wherever this gospel is preached, we're talking about it. All these years later, in Branson, Missouri. (laughs) So his word comes coming to pass. In the whole world that this woman has done is going to be told yes. for a memorial of her. So Jesus' prophecy is coming to pass in Branson Amen. tonight. 
Verse 14. Then, then, now, now I want to notice that the Lord brought this to my attention just last week. I'd seen glimpses of it before, but not as strong as, as now. The word then here means literally at that time. At what time? What's verse 13? What happened with the alabaster box? Verse 14, at that time, Judas went to the chief priests. Did you see this? They're connected. The woman given the box and him going to betray Jesus are directly connected. At that time, why? Jesus corrected him in front of the other guys. Did you hear me? And it was the last straw for Judas. The 30 grand he didn't get to steal. And being corrected in front of the other guys. That was it. At that time, immediately, he went to the high pri- chief priest, verse 15. And he said, he approached them. They didn't approach him. He went to them. And you know what he wants to know? How much will you give me? How much will you give me? And I'll, I'll turn, him, turn him over to you. I'll deliver him to you because he knew they were trying to get him. And they covenanted it with him for 30 pieces of silver. Now, people like to make out that it's something else more to this. It's about the money. <laughs> he wanted that money. Now, I don't know what had happened over the course of the past Three years, Jesus picked him to come be with them. Trust, he picked him one of the twelve and trusted him to handle the money. There had to be something redeeming about this man for Jesus to pick him in the first place. I believe in the early days of the ministry, Judas was just as excited to be there as Peter and John. And he was as thrilled to see the miracles and hear the wonderful messages and everything else but something happened to him something happened to him and I don't know the details but I do know I do know spiritually what happened because this is the way the devil works all the time he thought he should be getting more the devil will come and sit on people's shoulder and, and whisper to their mind They don't appreciate you. You're doing all this work. You should be paid better. You should be getting paid. You you deserve this and you deserve that. And they could have this and, and, and they got this. And why don't they give that to you? And Oh friend, this is dangerous stuff. What was the problem here? Mary valued Jesus far more than the money. Judas valued the money far more than Jesus. It's ugly, but it's reality. And the Bible says the love of money is the root. It's where it starts. The root. Uh, Some translations say of all kinds, all manner of evil. And friend, the enemy comes and lies to people and starts, you know, planting it. And he'll work on people for years with that discontent and that dissatisfaction. And I deserve more. He tries to do it people in their marriages, people in their work. You deserve to be treated better. You deserve to be paid better. Friend, when you hear that kind of thing, you need to do what Jesus did. When Peter came, Jesus told him he was going to the cross, going to be crucified. And and Peter took him aside and said, no, 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 Lord. This shall not be to thee. The margin says, he said, pity thyself. What's he saying? That's too high a price to pay, Jesus. For you to be crucified? No. No, no, no. That's too much. Too much. What did Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. Why? 
There's nothing too much to pay for what we're doing. Nobody owes me more. You ought to do it if you're not getting a penny. Knowing God's your source. Right? And not just doing it. Very glad. Doing it very gladly. Why? Because I reckon that the sufferings of this present time not even worthy to be compared with what God is allowing us to be a part of. Oh, can you see it? Why do people fuss so much about money? Because they love money. It's on their mind. That's why. Now, they know, they, they want to hide that they love money as much as they do, so they want to accuse and judge other people for not handling their money right and doing things. But why are you talking about it all the time? Because you've got money on the brain. Why? Huh? Because you love money. You want some money. <laughs> Judas got money on the brain. He had, they, they got so bad with him that when this woman came with this $30,000 personal gift for Jesus and just dumped it on his feet, he could not be quiet. It chafed him so bad. He said, what? 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 This is just a waste. He's looking at Jesus. He's looking at Mary down there on her knees, looking at him going. How many understand? Judas messed up a beautiful scene. Didn't he? But Jesus straightened him out. If he had the audacity to come in here and interrupt this woman's seat. Jesus looked at me and said, you leave her alone. How many think the piercing eyes of Jesus are telling you that? <laughs> but all it did to him is make him mad. It made him so mad he couldn't stand it. And immediately he went and found the high priest and said, how much? How much? What do you love the most, brother, sister? What do you think is the most valuable? What are you willing to pay? Hmm? What are you willing for it to cost you? Go to Genesis, please. I think we can close with this. See, that's what happened to Ananias and Sapphira. Same thing. Uh, that's what happened to Cain and Abel. Isn't it? Cain thought it was too much to bring good stuff. Expensive stuff. So he just brought something he had, something he's going to get rid of anyway. Hmm. But Abel, Abel thought nothing was too good for the Lord. Right? And he found fluffy. Fluffy was the 4-H blue ribbon winner, winner the, 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 the county fair, state fair winner, three years in a row. <laughs> Fluffy's picture was in the dictionary by sheep. I mean, she was. And, and he was able, was thrilled to give Fluffy to God. Right? And it made Cain so mad. Why? Because it showed up his lack of love, didn't it? Because if his heart had been right, and he had really been trying to honor the Lord, and he really did love the Lord, if he found out he'd come short, what would he want to do? He'd say, oh God, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Will you give me another opportunity? And man, he'd have moved what he had. But no, his heart wasn't right. Ananias and Sapphira. The Bible said in those days, early days of the church, the Spirit of God was moving. The Holy Ghost had fallen. People were being healed. Miracles were happening. And people began to sell their houses and their properties and bring the money to the church and lay it down at the apostles' feet. They're giving everything. They're giving places that's been in their family for generations. It, nothing was too much for them. And so Ananias and Sapphira want to be seen as people that have this kind of love and this kind of commitment and are willing to sacrifice like this. But when they sold the house, they got so much money for it. It was just too much to give. 
It was too much to put in one offering. It was too much for the church. It was too much. See, the other people, nothing was too much. But with them, it was too much. And so they lied about it. And they got judged. Oh, but friend, when you love him and his things, and that love is what's motivating you, you hardly even notice the cost. (laughs) Are y'all with me, friends? You're like, I'd be glad to pay more. (laughs) Why? Because of what you're getting. Genesis, are you there? I think this portrays this so beautifully. Genesis 29, a lot here, but down about verse uh, 17 or so, Jacob, you know, had had gone away and was with uh, his sneaky, lying Uncle Laban, (laughs) and, uh, you know, you think about this, what did Jacob do? That he had to leave home for. Sneaky. Lying. Tricky. And he's reaping hundredfold. (laughs) Sneaky. Lying. Tricky. With old Uncle Laban. (laughs) And he kept missing the fine print. On the contract. (laughs) And, And it kept costing him. And Uncle Laban had two girls. Leah, the oldest. And Rachel, and boy, Jacob loved Rachel. And he said to to Uncle Laban, he said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. Verse 19, Laban said, it's better that I give her to you than that, that I should give her to another man. Stay with me. And uh, they agreed. They didn't have a marriage the next day. (laughs) What's the agreement? Somebody say seven years. years. (laughs) Of your life. (laughs) Right? Verse 20. And Jacob served seven years. How many? Not months. Years, seven years. It's 2012. So when did, when when's the date? When's the marriage date? Huh? 2019. You got plenty of time to get out the invitations, <laughs> plan everything. Huh? Seven years. I want you to notice that last part. What does it say? What does it say? What does it say? They just seemed to him like a few days. What has the power to make seven years seem like a few days? For the love he had for her. He was so smitten. He was so struck until somebody came and said, how long are you working for Laban to get to marry Rachel? Seven, only seven years. (laughs) And I already got two behind me, so I'm basically there. (laughs) Just five more little short years. And I get Rachel. Rachel. Why do people think it's so hard? Why do people think it's so long? Oh, man. I've been serving on the clean team for three months. (laughs) I've been in the parking lot for three years. Is that a problem? I've been been serving the Lord. 
my own 20 year. <laughs> it's been a long, hard road. And we came up the rough side <laughs> of the mountain. <laughs> and about that time, it's time to tear up, you know, you go. <laughs> Nobody knows. What it cost me. That's not okay. That's acting unworthy. That you were asked and invited. And allowed. Into the greatest thing in the universe. Are y'all with me saints? If you saw right. And you thought right. And you loved him. I said and you loved him. Like Mary loved him. Come on, are you listening? You would very gladly spin and be spent. Huh? And the years would pass by like telephone poles on the highway. Come on, are you listening? And they would seem like a few days of your joy in serving him, knowing that it's just about to get way better. Than it is down here. Oh friend, let's get our mind renewed. Let's let's quit talking all the junk and let's don't let the devil do to us what he did to Judas. Infect your mind with this self pity and I deserve more. And I should have because when when you start talking about how hard it is and how much it's costing you that's what's going on. It's not that it's so hard. Is that you don't love it enough. You don't love God enough. You don't love His things enough. You love something else. And that's not good, friend, because all the things that are in the Bible said, love not this world. Neither the things that are in this world. Why? Because it's passing away. It's leaving here. It's rusting. It's rotting. It's fading. Oh, but he that does the will of God, the Bible says, abides forever. He said, I should read this scripture to you. He said that if you suffer with him, you qualify for something. Can you say amen? Amen. You believe it? 2 Timothy 2 and 12. You don't have to turn there. They'll put it up for us. 2 Timothy 2, 12. If we what? Suffer. Suffer. We shall also reign reign with Him. Your commitment and willingness to sacrifice, how far you're willing to go with that, is affecting how much you reign over. Your place in the kingdom of God. Some are going to re-rulers Over a city. Some over five cities. Some over ten cities. Why is it not equal across the board? Because some love more than others. Some are willing to sacrifice more than others. Some are willing to go further. Some couldn't be bothered to change up their routines. They couldn't be inconvenienced to miss their hobbies. Are you listening, friends? They had no time. Had no time for the church, no time for the ministry, no time, couldn't couldn't spare any money to help with the gospel or anything. And decades turn into a lifetime and it's time to leave and your opportunity is passed. Others, others got up early and stayed up late. Others spent every dime they had and believed for more. Come on, are you listening? Others spent it all and did it all and gave it all. So it's only right. That they have a different place. Don't you think that's only fair? That's only fair. That's only right. That they have a different place in the kingdom. Can you say amen? Amen. You know the disciples gathered around Jesus in Matthew 19. And when the rich young ruler missed his opportunity. What was the problem with him? That's too much. You're asking too much. And they said we. in, In Matthew 19, 27. We have forsaken all. And followed you. What shall we have? Verse 28. Jesus said you that have followed me. In, <coughs> in the regeneration. 
Uh, Luke says, you that have continued with me in my temptations, did it cost the disciples to follow Jesus? Oh, man. And after he was gone, it cost them. Some of them wound up getting crucified like he did. It cost them. But was it worth it, you reckon? I mean, they've been, they've been out of here for a long time now. <laughs> They're not hurting. And so they said, what about us? Because we did leave everything. And he said, you that have followed me, you're going to sit in the throne. The Son of Man's going to sit in the throne of his glory. And you're going to sit upon 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Do you think in time to come, as they're doing this on the throne, and it never changes, and it goes on eon after eon, that they're going to say, man, it was a big price we paid on the earth. Man, I still cry about it. No way, no how. Or do you reckon, do you reckon they'd say that the sufferings of this present time are not even worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed? Stand on your feet, everybody.